Again. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship him. Let's forget about ourselves and magnify his name and worship Christ the Lord. Worship him, Christ the Lord. Well, first of all, I'd like to welcome all of you that are here, members, visitors alike. We're glad that uh, we can all be together and worship the Lord together this morning. Um, just a reminder, if you'd take a moment, and if you're visiting with us especially, take one of the cards that you'll see in front of you. If you scan the QR code, you'll see a link to a connection card. We'd like to get some more information. Uh, if you wouldn't mind sharing that with us, we can be in contact with you. Uh, and also, the worship slides are there attached, as well as the link for online giving. All of that's available through the cards. Before we begin our time of worship this morning, uh, and continue on in our songs of praise, I'd like to read a passage out of Isaiah chapter 12. And I've got it on the screen here behind me. If you can read the text, it may be a little small. Isaiah 12. Speaking of the day, um, the day that the Lord um, brings about his promise to the people. You will say in that day, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, for though you were angry with me, your anger turned away that you might comfort me. Behold, God, oh, excuse me, I've got a different translation here. Let me start over. In that day you will say, I will praise you, Lord. Although you were angry with me, your anger is turned away and you have comforted me. Surely God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. The Lord, the Lord himself is my strength and my defense. He has become my salvation. With joy, you will draw water from the wells of salvation. In that day you will say, give praise to the Lord, proclaim his name, make known among the nations what he has done and proclaim that his name is exalted. Sing to the Lord, for he has done glorious things. Let this be known to all the world. Shout aloud and sing for joy, people of Zion, for great is the Holy One of Israel among you. This morning, as we give our songs of praise to the Lord, I like to think about what's written there in verse 3, the end of that first slide. With joy we draw water from the wells of salvation. That's something that we've come together this morning to do. I know first and foremost when we worship, our aim is to give glory to God. But when we're here together and in each other's presence and most importantly in his presence, think about how we're drawing water from that well of salvation, how that restores us, how that brings hope, how that, uh, that helps us be reminded of what's to come in the next life after this world is over. Would you stand with me? Let's worship our God together. Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God. Born of his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song. Praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story. This is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, perfect delight. Visions of rapture now burst on my side. Angels descending, bring from above. Echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Perfect submission, all is at rest. I and my Savior am happy and blessed, watching and waiting, looking above, filled with his goodness, lost in his love. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. 
This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior all the day long. Everyone needs compassion, a love that's never failing. Let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. So take me as you find me, all my fears and failures. Fill my life again. I give my life to follow everything I believe in. Now I surrender. Savior, he can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. He is mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, he rose and conquered the grave. Jesus conquered the grave. Savior, you can move the mountains. My God is mighty to save. You are mighty to save forever. Author of salvation, you rose and conquered the grave. Yes, you conquered the grave. Hosanna, you're my king. I worship and I sing. I lift your holy name up on high. I worship and adore. Sing praise forevermore. Hosanna, you're my King forevermore. Be seated, please. Good morning, family. Let's bow. Father, what a privilege it is, always, um, to be able to have this avenue to just approach your throne, to come to you with our thoughts, our prayers, our, uh, our praise, our thanks, our requests, and um, <clears throat> you already know everything, and, um, <clears throat> and yet, uh, I know it pleases you to hear from your children, and it's always a special privilege to, uh, to be here this morning, to have the freedom to worship to assemble, and uh, as, <clears throat> as I lift my voice, I know that uh, throughout the church, uh, prayers are being offered, uh, your family is together around the world, and um, that's, a, that's a powerful thing, that's an encouraging thing, and uh, so <clears throat> I pray that as we meet this morning, the things that we do and say would uh, be acceptable in your sight, that we would truly worship in spirit and truth, that you'd be glorified by the uh, the word that as it's preached, that the truth would be spoken, that the truth would be heard, that it would be taken in by those of us who hear. Help us, Lord, to have ears that, uh, <clears throat> that hear and uh, feet that go and do, that we'll be doers of the word, not hearers who deceive ourselves, <clears throat> those who just warm a pew and uh, uh, you know, take up a place on a Sunday morning, but actually go out and apply those things between Sundays <clears throat> and take your word into our hearts. And then that your word would just not be something, Lord, that uh, is heard on a Sunday morning, but is something that we are 
actively diving into uh, on our own uh, each day. You know, as Jesus said, we don't live by bread alone, but every word that proceeds from your mouth. And we, we discover in your story, as we just sang, Lord, that you are mighty to save, mighty to rescue. That's your business. It's what you do. You authored our salvation. Uh, You wrote the book on our lives. You've created us. You've made us in your image. You've made us to seek you, and you're not far from us. We thank and praise you for that, and we're thankful for the gift of grace that someone shared the gospel with us that we could find you, and we're here now. For those who haven't found you yet, Lord, but they're seeking, I pray that their hearts would be opened and touched, that they would take that next step and move closer to obedience and walk faithfully with you. I want to pray especially for our kids this morning as they go back to school. We have a special celebration coming up for them. Uh, Not sure how celebratory they're feeling as school begins, but um, we praise you for that. And I ask that you guard their hearts and minds as they go to school. There's many things being taught these days that really aren't in keeping with uh, the truth. Truth, capital T, your word, but also just truth in general. Um, Yeah, there's math, and that's black and white, but we've tried to mess that up too. Just give them, give them discernment, give them wisdom. I pray that their parents would be doing the things at home that need to be done, Father, to instill your word and your, your truth in their hearts and their minds that they can be wise and discerning. But give them discernment in school. Give them strength to resist peer pressure. Uh, something that has just existed throughout time and always will is that pressure to conform and go along. But you know, we know <clears throat> you've called us to be transformed, not conformed to this world. And that happens as we renew our minds. And that happens through your word. Give our kids strength, Lord. Help them to be lights. Help them to stand up for what's right. Help them to be good students. Help them to be good examples for you. Help them to have fun and enjoy this time of life because it is, it's a special blessing to be a kid and to grow up and, and go to school and have friends and play sports and do all the things that kids do. We ask that you bless them in that. And I pray for your strength and wisdom for parents as they come home and, and deal with different things. Uh, help us to guide our kids, and those kids who are still in school, and our kids who are just kids, Father. Uh, in a way that glorifies you and uh, leads them along the path uh, that is walking in light with you. <clears throat> Thank you so much for our time this morning. I'm thankful for each one's here, each one who is here, and uh, <clears throat> just ask that you convict each one of us, Father, as we leave here today and as we walk with you daily. Help us to look at ourselves in the mirror of your word and see the things that we need to change. Give us strength to repent and make those changes, and to just walk a little bit closer with you, to let your, sh- your light shine a little bit brighter and bring glory to you in our lives. And we just love and praise you, Father, for all that you have done for us, and ultimately through your Son, Jesus, that you sent to die on our behalf through the Holy Spirit you've given us to dwell in us as a seal of a future hope that we have in life with you in heaven. We love you, Lord, and thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Welcome. I will uh, skip over some of the preliminaries. I think Ryan did a good job of... uh, asking you if you're visiting with us today to fill out uh, one of the connection cards that you can get to through the QR code. I should let you know, we're glad you're here. We're glad you're joining us if you are online. We're glad if you're visiting. Uh, If you are more analog than digital, there are also just some cards you could fill out out of the Welcome Center. See the guy out, the person out of the Welcome Center and they'll give you that. We would love to just know who you are and be able to say thank you for joining us today. Uh, And please stick around. We are having a brunch. Uh, the best thing about brunch is that anything goes, so I have no idea what's out there. I just know there's a lot of good food out there. No Bible class today. When we're done with our first assembly this morning, we'll spend the next hour and a half or so until 11 o'clock fellowshipping, celebrating our kids, enjoying a meal together before late service starts at 11. So whether you brought something or not, stick around. There's always plenty of food to eat, and we would love to get to know you. We have been in Joshua, and if you've got your Bibles in front of you, which I sure hope you do, I hope you brought a Bible of some form to church You might want to start moving toward Joshua chapter 22 today. We've been focusing on the promised land, and and as we have been there in the promised land, we've learned some things. We've learned some things about God. We've learned some things about Israel, the Israelites. We've learned some things about Joshua himself, as well as some other people who had an impact on this story. Last week, um, we we covered nine chapters in one week, but really, you know, we, we started out with the idea that we're going to the courthouse to look over some deeds pretty dry stuff, but I hope you saw last week that what that was was no less than the reading of the will. 
Uh, that's an incredible thing. This is the distribution of the land. This is where God uh, takes that promise that he made 650 years before to Abraham, where he says, just in general, someday I'm going to give your people a homeland out there somewhere. He takes that general promise and he gets very specific. Here's your deed. Here's the deed to your land. This is your inheritance. Here are the boundaries. Now go make a life uh, in service to me. Along the way, I hope it was a chance for you to reflect on what it means to be in the will for us today. Because we are God's kingdom people today. And we are, uh, we're heirs to a great salvation. We're heirs to all sorts of, of blessings if we are in Christ, if we have been added to the church. And so it was an opportunity for us to think about our spiritual promised land as well. I did point out last week that the distribution of the land sort of amounts to the climax of the story in Joshua. It's a lot more than that, but, but certainly in this book that we've been spending really all summer going through, uh, it is the high point there. Uh, but what I want us to be careful of is that we not see this as, well, we've, we've reached the climax and so everything else is the anti-climax. Uh, I think it would be a mistake to sort of say, well, the rest of the story doesn't really matter. And so what I'd like for us to do today and next Sunday, I want us to think of these last three chapters sort of as, as Joshua saying his goodbyes. Today uh, in chapter 22, he's going to say goodbye in a sense to a specific group of people. Uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time talking about that. The story itself is of more interest today. But let next Sunday, as we wrap this series up, uh, really Joshua is going to be saying his final goodbyes. This is Joshua at the end of his life as he's ready to hand the reins of leadership off uh, and to go and to be with his God. And so the, the goodbyes that he has to say and the challenges that he has to leave for God's people, I think, will resonate with us as well. So back, back before the conquest of the promised land begins, and you know this story is found in a number of, of the books of the Torah, the law, the first five books uh, of the Old Testament. Uh, Numbers chapter 32 records something. Um, it records a proposal. Some of the tribes of Israel, remember there are 12 tribes of Israel but uh, because there are 12 children of Jacob, but it's a little different because uh, the tribe of Levi is the priest. They don't get land. Uh, Joseph has... Uh, doesn't have a named tribe. He gets two tribes named for his two children. So you end up with 12 tribes, but instead of uh, the Levites getting land, you get the tribe of Ephraim and the tribe of Manasseh getting land, uh, inheritance in the land. And, and a group of these tribes come to Moses, and they've got this proposal. They, they've been living with the rest of the Israelites on the east side of the Jordan. They have not gone into the, the promised land yet. That is all in, that's all coming. And they realize, you know, this land is good for the stuff we do. This land suits us. And so they say to Moses, in effect, we'd kind of like to stay here. And we'd, we'd love it if this could be our inheritance. And so, you know, um, and even though it's not in the promised land, God listens to that proposal and essentially he's, he's okay with that. And so he allows for the, the tribes of Reuben and Gad and the, the tribe of Manasseh, which is usually referred to in the Bible as the half tribe of Manasseh, Ephraim and Manasseh. He allows them to to stay on the east side of the Jordan. And they come to be known as the Transjordan tribes. Uh, that's, I don't know, probably using that here in the sermon today. Just wanted to make sure that you knew what we're talking about. Interestingly, the tribes that go into the promised land are usually called the Cisjordan tribes, but you start throwing cis around and CIS and people are thinking gender stuff and we're not getting into that today. But the Transjordan tribes, and, and they're allowed to do this. They're allowed to, to take their homeland on the east side of the Jordan, but really there's one condition. And that condition is that uh, as the, go back to the beginning of Joshua, as the, as the tribes are getting ready to cross the Jordan and to go into Canaan and to take the land, these three tribes have to come with them. They have to send their fighting men. They have to help the rest of the tribes take the land, even though it's not going to be their land. They have to go in and they have to join the battle. And if they do that, then yes, when the fighting's over, they'll get to go back and live in their land. And so apparently they do this willingly. Uh, there's no pushback. They do this well. They're effective. And uh, we get to the stage where we're at in this study. And so now we're in chapter 22, and this story is all over. And so Joshua commends these tribes for their service. This is a sense of what it's going to look like now. and not a perfect description because some of the boundaries are not exactly, uh, we're not exactly able to find them exactly today if you went there and looked at some of the descriptions. But this is a general sense of what the promised land is going to look like, what the inheritance is going to look like. And so uh, Joshua releases these three tribes to go back to their land, to go back to their homeland. And so they head east. They've got to cross the Jordan, you know, going the other way now. They come back to the Jordan. They've got to cross over uh, sort of in reverse to what we saw in chapter 6. And, uh, and so they get ready to do that. But before they cross, they do something strange. 
And we read it here in chapter 22, verses 9 and 10, especially verse 10. It says, when they came to Gelaloth, near the Jordan, in the land of Canaan, the Reubenites, the Gadites, and the half-tribe of Manasseh built an imposing altar by the Jordan. We don't really know where this, this comes from. We didn't see any instructions about this. We're not sure exactly yet why they do this. We don't know what to make of it. You know, we, uh, we don't know yet what the altar is for. Uh, and so, you know, we don't know what their motivation is for building it. We're a little confused. It kind of seems innocent, I have to say, because one of the things we probably have noticed, I, I hope you've noticed as we've gone through this book and as we think about the Old Testament, it's not uncommon for, you know, for Old Testament people, God's people, to, to say, you know, we should remember this. Let's build a pile of stones that will remind us about this thing that happened. So we've talked about a couple of those just in this book. And so this is essentially what they're doing here. So it's not shocking. It's not like we've never seen this before. But we don't really know what it's for. But we know something's up. We know something's up when we see how the rest of the Israelites react. Because starting in verse 11, it says, And when the Israelites heard that they had built the altar on the border of Canaan at Gelaloth near Jordan on the Israelite side, here's the, here's the thing that gets your attention. The whole assembly of Israel gathered at Shiloh to go to war with them. <laughs> Excuse me? <laughs> I, I didn't see that coming. Did you see that coming? That's just not what you expect to be the next thing that happens in this story. They build an altar and they start mustering armies. You know, just last week we read what, what I think we would say was a happy ending to, to a complicated story. The worst of the fighting is now over. We know that there's still some mop-up duty there, that, that there are still people that they need to deal with in the land who are going to be a problem for them in their relationship with God. And so that's not all solved, but it's mostly done. The land is mostly at peace. It's finally time... You know, it's time for everybody now to go to their land, to go to, their, to their, uh, their inheritance, and to do what they've been waiting to do for centuries, which is to make a life there, to make a life as God's people in his promised land. And so everything is good at the end of chapter 21, and now suddenly we are on the verge of civil war, brother against brother. What happened? What went wrong? It doesn't make any sense. Fortunately, I have to say, as we, as we continue with this story in chapter 22, there's still some time for diplomacy. The other tribes, you know, they muster for war, but they gather some diplomats together. They gather a delegation, and they send them off to the Transjordan tribes. But as we read further, we begin to see how these two groups are they're looking at this one event, this one activity, the building of this altar. And they're seeing it from two very different perspectives. And the result is a very bad, very dangerous thing that's about to happen. And so in the meantime, as they're getting ready to negotiate, the unity of, of this entire nation, God's chosen people, his first, his first kingdom people, our spiritual ancestors, the unity of this entire nation is hanging by a thread. Even after all that they've been through together, even after all that, that God has done for them, they are this close to losing it all. That's a terrifying thing. I feel like in the last... Um, Coming up on three years, at least two and a half years, I've probably preached about unity more than any one thing. Uh, couched in a lot of different language, in a lot of different studies, in a lot of different places in the Word of God, but it's been a concern of mine, it's been a concern of the elders, it's been a concern of, of yours, I think, as we live in a world that uh, deals with a lot of disunity, and I think if we, if we didn't know it before, we certainly should know it now, unity is highly valuable, but it is also extremely fragile. It doesn't take much to, to break up unity. Think about all the elements that, that are continually really conspiring to try to break God's people apart, not just in the time of Joshua, but in our time today. We're surrounded by things like this. And I don't know about you, but I think I talked to enough people to know that I think many of us feel this. We feel this wedge of, of pressure from all these different sources that are trying to break us apart, right? Uh, that wedge sometimes is culture. I think Paul alluded to some of that today in his prayer. Sometimes that wedge is more specific. It's, it's politics and how that can, can separate people that, that should be citizens first and foremost of God's eternal nation, but who find themselves allied more closely to a group or a party or an ideology or a person. Sometimes it's even you know things that we think of as good that are driving wedges between us, things like our prosperity, things like our freedom. These things can also be de divisive. And I think about, you know, spiritual warfare, looking out at the world and seeing how Satan does what he does. And perhaps Satan is most effective when he works to divide God's people. 
It certainly seems to be one of his favorite tools, and I suspect that's because, boy, he's good at it and it works. Well, I have to tell you, no story, no, no scripture is going to tell us everything that we need to know about unity. There's not a one-stop shop. Just remember this verse and it's all going to work out. But, but this passage here in Joshua 22, I think, is illuminating. And as I hope we're seeing more and more as we study the Old Testament, it is surprisingly timely. We see people living a long time ago, more than 3,000 years ago in this case, and yet we see, I think, I hope, or sometimes unfortunately, we see ourselves in their actions because they are human and we are as well. Here, the, the core of the threat to unity is something as simple and as fundamental as poor communication. An altar is built for a reason. There is a reason. Perhaps it's a valid reason. We're going to get to that. But it's built without explanation. It's built without consultation. It's built without confession. And what happens there? It leaves things open to interpretation. Oh, man, that gets us in trouble, right? Interpretation, reading motives, assigning my meaning to your actions without knowing why you're doing what you're doing. Man, that is, uh, that is, it. That is something that we are all, if we're looking in the mirror, we are all guilty of. And, and how often does that go well? How often do you get to the end and think, wow, I nailed that. Boy, I, I got that just right. I, 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 it, was a, it ended up being a good thing. I'm sure glad I did that. Man, it, it just doesn't work when we assign our meaning to other people's actions. The, the Transjordan tribes, as we go through chapter 22, we discovered they have some concerns. What if they had, they had taken those concerns and they had expressed them to the whole family, the whole kingdom, before they had headed back east? What if they had done that instead? Perhaps they could have been reassured and they wouldn't have needed to take any action. Or, or maybe they might have, have built this same altar, but with a level of understanding and with support from all the tribes, and it would have ended up differently. Instead, there are assumptions. Why? Because there's a vacuum of information. And so the assumptions fill the vacuum, right? They fill the void. Motivation is read into the situation. And what happens to unity? Unity begins to fracture. How often do we do this in our relationships? Right? We act for our own good reasons, we think, but we act without explaining. We leave other people to draw their own conclusions. And you know what? We're shocked when they reach conclusions that, that are not anything close to what we intended. How could, you, how could you assume that? How could you go there? Did you not know what I was thinking? Did you not know what my motivation was? Well, of course not. I never told you. Or maybe somebody else acts without explaining, and I choose to interpret their actions. See if this describes you. It certainly describes me. Sometimes I choose to interpret their actions in the most unflattering way possible in the least understanding way possible instead of, it, instead of assuming the best in them, instead of giving grace to them. What a mess that can lead to. I would, I would share some stories, but some of you would be in them and you probably wouldn't appreciate it. Uh, and I certainly and have things that I would love to share as well. That's because, you know, these sorts of things happen in, in close relationships when we don't communicate effectively. With, with our spouses, with our children, with our friends, with our coworkers, and of, of course, with our brothers and sisters in Christ, people in the church. Even God's people could, could use more openness on, on the one end and, and more, more goodwill, more grace on the other end. And yet perhaps there's a deeper issue here that we see in this story that reveals something in us as well. Perhaps there's a, a deeper issue in that poor communication creates an opening. Poor communication creates an opening for our fears. It creates an opening for our insecurities. And then Satan is there again, poised and ready. And he uses these openings. He uses our fears and our insecurities with incredible creativity. I, I want to give him his due because he is creative at what he does. And I think we see this in action here spectacularly in Joshua chapter 22. The tribes who live in Canaan read malice into the building of this altar. They see this as a terrible thing. They are ready to go to war against family primarily because, why? Because because they're afraid. They're they're afraid. They're afraid that God's judgment is going to come down on those tribes. That's bad enough. They're also afraid that God's judgment is going to blow back on them. That they're going to be the victims of God's judgment. Why? Because, Because this has already happened. 
This has happened to God's people, and it's pretty fresh in their minds. You go back to Numbers chapter 25, you tell, it tells the story of how uh, during a time when Moses is still alive, they are, they're living in the land, they're getting ready, they're not quite ready to pass into the promised land, they're living around the Moabites, and the Moabites suck them in through sexual temptation and the way that they worship their gods. A large chunk of, of, the, of Israel gets sucked into sexual immorality and the worship of the false god Baal. And God, as we know God to be, God is furious. Why? Because idolatry, the worshiping of false gods, is to God adultery. It is unfaithfulness. And so God takes action. He sends a plague. 24,000 Israelites are killed because of God's wrath and punishment for their unfaithfulness. And it only ends when a teenager, a guy named Phineas, intervenes to stop it. I'll leave you to go read that story in chapter 25. It will shock you. Now Phineas is back and he's an adult and he's, he's the leader of this delegation. He's the leader of the delegation that the rest of the tribes send to the Transjordan tribes to go talk to these people, to go negotiate with them. You think he remembers that plague? I'll bet he does. You think the rest of the people remember that plague? They all remember it. They all remember even more recently how something we just read a couple of chapters ago, how the sin of Achan had consequences for the entire nation. They were there. They saw it. People died. They're so concerned that they even offer the Transjordan tribes like a part of their inheritance. Like, look, come back. Let's dismantle this altar. You leave that land that you like behind. We'll give you some of our land. You can come. You can take some of our inheritance. We'll split it up with you. Please just don't do this thing. Why? Because this is a scared bunch. They're looking to the heavens and they're waiting for the lightning bolts to start to fly and they just really don't want to be caught uh, when God expresses his wrath. But you know what? The, the, the Cisjordan tribes, they're not the only ones who are afraid. Because we read this in chapter 22 and you can start up around verse 22 if you want, but in particular down in, in verse 24, it's talking about how they're, they're saying to, to this delegation, if there had been rebel, if we were being rebellious, if we were being disobedient, then, then you should definitely do what you have come to do. But, but they, they say in verse 24, no, we did it for fear. We did it for fear that someday your descendants might say to ours, what do you have to do with the Lord, the God of Israel? Who are you? Where did you come from? We don't know you. Transjordan tribes are, are scared. They're, they're scared that because they chose to live, you know, across the river, that over time God's people would forget that they were still part of his holy nation. They were scared that would happen. They were scared that because of that, eventually they would get cut off. They were scared that because of all of those things working together, that, that eventually they might stray from worshiping the one true living God. They might get sucked into idolatry and adultery because they didn't have the support system of the entire nation working together. They were living in fear. And so we see poor communication exposing raw fear and insecurity, which leads to misunderstanding and jumping to conclusions, and the worst is assumed, and Israel stands at the brink of war. This is real. I must admit, it's never ended up in, in violent confrontation, but you know, I, I've seen that pattern in my own life from time to time. I, I confess that, that when it happens, I always make a note of it. I always stop and pause and thank God for showing me the error of my ways and for straining me out and for helping me to realize so that, that I'll learn from it and not repeat it because it is miserable to go through. And then I often find myself in the same situation again. I find myself doing the same thing again because I haven't really dealt with those core fears. I haven't really dealt with those core insecurities. Or because, you know, maybe it's more basic. Maybe it's because I, um, I find myself to be I don't know about you, I find myself to be deficient in what Jesus calls the second greatest command, the idea that I should love my neighbor as myself. I, I struggle with that, and so I'm susceptible to assuming the worst in other people. I'm not supposed to, but I do. And I have to say, I've also been on the receiving end of all that, and it's not much fun either, you know, whatever end you're on. Of course, the, the solution for this misunderstanding <clears throat> in Joshua is to go back and to do what they should have done in the first place, which is, which is to be open with each other, which is to talk, which is to communicate. 
Unity is preserved here in Israel because both sides do something positive here at the moment of truth. When, when, they're, when they're at a choice point and things could go south and there could be disaster, instead they do something positive. And the root of their positive ac- action, the root of it, is that they still love each other. And they still want this relationship to be preserved. That's the core. If you don't have that, you don't have much. They have that. And because of that love, one side still cares enough to go to the other and to confront them, to confront them honestly, to ask them instead of assuming, even though the language is one of assumption, they're expressing it in a way that will give the Transjordan tribes a chance to say, whoa, 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 wait a second, that's not what we meant. They ask instead of assuming. They try to get the facts before they do something that they might regret. This is a better approach than the ones that we often use, like, you know, stewing over it. That doesn't produce unity. Or gossiping about it. That doesn't produce unity. Or reacting without, without seeking truth. That certainly doesn't produce unity. Only confronting the issue and confronting it head on can bring God's people together. And yet that still won't solve this problem unless it's received with the right spirit. Unless that open and honest and frank challenging conversation is absorbed in the way that it should be. But here we see that the other side, the Transjordan tribes, instead of getting their pride up, which we tend to do, instead of getting defensive, which we tend to do, they instead react with humility. And I have to say humility that also stems from mutual love, for wanting to be in, in unity with, these, with all of these people. This is, this is hard. You know, humility exposes weakness. Humility exposes inadequacy. Humility admits mistakes. Humility is the antithesis of pride, and yet real communication is usually, almost always, in fact, impossible without it. But with that openness and honesty and humility comes understanding and truth and ultimately the ultimate goal, oneness, unity. In the end, as we look in chapter 22 in Joshua, although they take the long and dangerous and frankly unnecessary route, uh, the path that they would look back and say, well, I wish we had done this differently, even though that's the path they chose, God's people come together again here on the banks of the Jordan. They come together as one people despite a river that literally runs between them. They are one. They are unified. And they become a powerful witness to who God is. They choose together to let that altar stand. But they don't just let it stand. They give it a name. And that name is a witness between us that the Lord is God. Which reminds us or should remind us of how much God wants his people today to live in unity. Unity at all costs, that's a different conversation. But unity at most cost. Unity at great cost. God wants us to live in unity. Paul reminds us in Romans 12 that in Christ, we who are many and who are really different, just look around, we who are many, we, we together form one. As Paul, the great apostle and theologian, no less than Jesus prays in John chapter 17 that his disciples will be one. He says, as, as I and the Father are one, that we'll be one to such an extent that we'll be known for our oneness, that we'll be identified by our oneness, that we'll be recognized and celebrated or hated, perhaps, because of our oneness, because of our unity. When we stand as one, despite all the things that are working to divide us, we bring glory to our God. Let's stand together and sing praises to the God who brings us together. me whole, saves my soul, washes whiter than snow, faithful love calms each fear, reaches down, dries each tear, holds my hand when I can stand on my own, faithful love from
face to face, and Jesus is his name. Faithful love is a friend, just when hope seems to end. Welcome face, sweet embrace, tender touch filled with grace. Faithful love, endless power, living flame, spirit's fire, burning bright in the night, guiding my way. Faithful love from above came to earth to show the fire. And I'll never be the same For I've seen faithful love face to face And Jesus is his name What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my pardon, this I see. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can for sin atone, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Not of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Be seated, please. Good morning, everyone. How are we doing this morning? In all things, we give thanks to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I struggle getting out of bed sometimes, most times. <laughs> the alarm goes off. And I don't want to. <laughs> the snooze feature is nearly worn out at my house. <laughs> Why do I eventually get up? Because I have responsibilities. My family, my job, my faith. When any one of these responsibilities fade or get back burnered, I hit the snooze button more. I'm so thankful that God didn't have a snooze button. God had a plan and has a plan. That plan has not changed nor been delayed. We all have tried to understand the pain that Jesus went through for us. Not once did he sway in his plan. John 1.7 says, But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another, and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. Try to remember every time that alarm goes off that Jesus suffered for you, and I. He suffered. Let that sink in for a minute.
I'm sure we have all gone through pain, but I bet it was minimal to what Jesus went through. And that And he went through a lot of pain for us guys. It's hitting me right now. I'm sorry. He loved us so much and went through that suffering for us. It's hitting me. I'm sorry, man. It's hitting me. I'm sure many of us would award, would avoid our pain if possible. But God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, as we receive the emblems this morning, may we remember the sacrifice, the pain, the love, and the man that Jesus is. We are undeserving of this love, but God, you think we are worth it. Let us not drift through our week, but shine your light. Amen. Let me ask you all to please stand. Let's worship together before we are dismissed. There's a peace I've come to know. Though my heart and flesh may fail, there's an anchor for my soul. I can say, it is well Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won he is risen from the dead and I will rise when he calls my shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is 
one. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain, I will rise on eagle's wings before my God, fall on my knees and rise, I will rise, rise. Be seated, please. Good morning. Nice crowd this morning. I don't know if it's because it's the end of the summer or we have food, but we'll just let that be what it is. Uh, a couple announcements here before we break. Um, it's back to school time, so if we don't have any classes today, but if your child is moving up next week, they will move up to the new class. All the class locations are the same this year, so if you have any questions on that, please see Amber or Katie. As you might know or smell or have participated, we do have a brunch today, so please uh, sit tight. It's in celebration of back to school. Some students might be calling it more of a memorial, but most of us are calling it a celebration uh, of back to school. And so just wait until, we're gonna wait a little while and let some of the others from second service come, bring their food, feel free to get a cup of coffee, socialize, do what we normally do. Uh, but a little before 10, we will do an opening prayer uh, to bless the food. Uh, and so that will be your point that you can break and dig into all those uh, chump, uh, smelly uh, goods that we have out there. So uh, with that, uh, let's just close with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you for allowing us to be here this morning and worship freely. We thank you for the way that you've blessed our lives. And even though there are trials and challenges in this life, we know that we have something bigger and greater to look forward to. And we thank you for you, the hope you give us and the love that you show us. We pray, pray a special prayer this morning for all those uh, children and students and college kids that are all going back to class and getting into the new routine. All the parents who are also trying to adjust to the new schedules and we just pray that you will bless them, you will guide them, that they will have a wonderful year. And we'll pray also for all of those teachers that are amongst us as they also adjust and take on a new class. We thank you for those opportunities in Jesus' name, amen.